great pleasure in introducing the first speaker of today, Dr. Roon Rasmussen. And today he's going to be talking uh, to us about the year of Aum, uh, which is absolutely fascinating. So without further ado, I will hand over to Roon. Roon, you should be able to just share your screen whenever you wish to. Yes. Thank you very much. Let me just make sure that uh, you can hear me. Can you hear this? Cool. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm just going to take this one off so you can you can hopefully still hear me. Uh, yeah, and thanks. Thanks so much for the great honor of, uh, <laughs> of uh, presenting here again this year. I'm really happy about it. And I'm just going to put on my thing here. Um, cool. Yeah, in in um, Medieval, in a medieval Viking age, myth King Alan the Old of Sweden. He murdered his own sons. He sacrificed them to Odin in order to go on living. Uh, he sacrificed one every eight years. And this rather atrocious behavior uh, then uh, probably came to be a model for the falling out and realignment of the cycles of the sun and the sun, the sun and the moon, which probably defined the dates of those Oct annual celebrations. Oh, wait a second, I just need to these ones. <laughs> um, where pre Christian heathens gathered and uh, performed these uh, grand celebration feasts every eight years in their regional centers, such as in Leida in uh, Sealand and in Uppsala in, in central Sweden. And uh, Vikings, uh, then the Vikings, decided to actually ritually mirror. King Aun's rather atrocious behavior with their own rather atrocious human sacrifices at those octennial celebrations that King Aun's mythic infanticized sort of mapped out of time, right? Now, what relevance in all conceivable worlds, you know, what relevance can possibly this complex of rather gruesome Iron Age behavior have to sane contemporary people? What relevance is there in these grand octennial celebrations that Scandish Moobians, heathens, sort of um, celebrated before Christianity became normative in, in the region? Well, I actually think it has quite a bit of very strong contemporary relevance. In fact, surprisingly relevant. Um, I wasn't aware of how relevant it was when at some point um, this last year, I, I uh, well, the theory had been brewing for some time, but I, I kind of introduced to some people a theory of exactly how to create uh, a loony solar criterion for dating these octennial celebrations based on the confluence of a new moon and the winter solstice. And it's a little bit funky to explain, uh, but I, I'm doing this on my YouTube channel, so you can, you can check it out there. Now, I checked out this theory that I have with people that are wiser than myself, such as Matthias Nordvik and uh, Joshua Root and Maria Lissetti Jacobson and others. Um, and uh, most people actually liked my theory uh, quite a lot and said that it really made sense. So then we kind of got together sort of a group of contemporary vo voices from the sort of Norse files and networks online to sort of uh, say, yeah, okay, this is a pretty good theory. So now we are declaring this year of celebration, the year of our 2023, when this confluence of the um, new moon and the winter solstice happens. Uh, again, th there were also other options that we could have chosen from, but we say, okay, let's go with 2023 when it happens. Um, and uh, yeah, I uh, and you can go and see all that. And now I'm I'm putting a little <laughs> link in there. <laughs> you can see me talking about that on on my list on this playlist on the the our year that I have on my cat channel. Uh, then I went on to start sort of dialoguing with people about what the flip to do then, because one thing is that we know that this is a time to do. Another thing is that we know that people in the Viking age did something and they sacrificed a hell of a lot of people, but what do you do with that today? You know, and it's actually a rather uh, difficult question. Um, so I've been sort of trying to create dialogues about it and sort of speak with, 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 with people uh, about it. Um, and uh, also because I kind of feel that this sort of thing probably emerges in the best way from sort of communal processes of people talking to each other rather than just one uber nerd who was sitting in his man cave and thinking up some stuff, you know. So and besides um, Matthias and Josh that I already uh, mentioned here and Maria Lisette Jacobson and others, 
I spoke to all kinds of actually very different people, such as the Aboriginal Australian uh, thinker, philosopher, Tyson Juncker-Porter, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, Johan Heck from Amon Amar, actually, that, um, and, and his wife that I've been also talking talk to about this stuff. Um, I don't know, maybe I just feel home with like, together with, with heterosexual shit kickers with long beards and long hair. I think perhaps there's something I need to work on there. Uh, anyway, but this is also why I, I, I really want to sort of try to create dialogues and, 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 and have people sort of think with it and talk about this stuff because it isn't actually really, really clear what's exactly supposed to happen about it, right? And this, I really hope that also here now that, that we'll have a time to uh, sort of exchange and, and talk a little bit about it rather than just me basking in the glow of my own voice. No, I do enjoy the shit out of that, but it's not always the, the creative thing to do. Um, cool. So I want to uh, just talk a little bit about how, how uh, we can approach this ancient myth in order to understand it so we can perhaps get started on creating contemporary uh, theory, uh, contemporary ceremony about it. Right. So what does the myth mean? Right. Now, I think that the the Aum story is primarily a story about break of kinship. And that, I think, is a general theme in Nordic animist knowledge, uh, most iconically from the Ragnarok myth, uh, Hoder uh, killing Baldur, that fratricide that makes the whole interconnectedness of the world sort of unravel and come apart the ash burns and everything descends into conflict. But also you also see it in, in folklore where you find these breaks on relations uh, that are either recovered through some uh, arduous trial or not recovered and then uh, results in collapse and madness. Now, uh, King Aun, he, um, he kills his own seeds, his own de descendants and ends up and lives on and lives on and ends up completely paralyzed where he's eating out of a, uh, a horn, like a medieval baby bottle, really. And that is, in fact, very much not an ideal behavior, even of an Iron Age kingship where human sacrifices were something that was a, a, a common practice. Uh, it, it is definitely not an ideal behavior of an Iron Age king to kill his own descendants. Um, and, and that is also what uh, Tyson Junkerport immediately saw uh, uh, when in, in my dialogue with him, and that is that this is a cautionary tale, right? Um, and the pre-Christian sacrificial practice then seems to be mirroring that uh, in, in sort of perhaps to make up for that cosmic break of kinship that myth is, is uh, uh, talking about. And how does that apply today? You know, I mean, we don't sacrifice humans. Uh, well, we actually uh, kind of do, you know, uh, when children are gone down in some American school somewhere, then is that a human sacrifice to perhaps the principle of freedom? You know, and is there some element of sacralization of their death taking place in public eulogies and these kind of things? Probably, you know, but we don't like throw blondes with bullet bras into volcanoes and hang thralls in groves and all that stuff. And importantly, we don't want to do that, right? So first, the myth certainly makes a lot of sense today. Uh, and it, uh, but how, how, you know, how does it speak to us and how does it make sense to build a response? And I'm not totally not finished understanding this, as, as I've mentioned, uh, but I'd like to throw out some thoughts about that has sort of emerged in these different dialogues that I've been having. Um, how do we today respond to the proximity of the Ragnarok? These worms that are gnawing at the roots of the Yggdrasil, this constant or perhaps cyclically growing threat or cyclically returning threat against uh, the animist interconnectedness of, of, of a cosmos, right? Um, we live today, I think, in a, in a relational crisis, uh, not only in our in uh, not only in, in our way of apocalyptically extracted extracted consumption, which is driving that ongoing on the side, which is pressing us towards the biggest collapse in the history of life for sixty six million years, 
Um, but it's also about stuff like the way that we are getting encased in mirror cabinets, which creates polarization. This is a rupture of connectedness, right? Uh, so it's an, it's an aspect of that rupture of kinship, we could say. Notice, by the way, that the Ragnarok itself is also a polarization. Gods and giants, or Yatnar, they used to have all kinds of weird relations until interconnectedness crumbled, and then they then started this total war, behaving more like Christian angels and demons, and that is the Ragnarok. And we also have, we have deeply pathological patterns of consumption. We produce and discard stuff in a hy hysteric frenzy of hatred towards the world. Uh, and we encase ourselves in this hyper availability of impulse satisfaction. Any imaginable addiction that you can possibly have, there will be an availability of, of uh, having it satisfied all the time. It's that ounce baby bottle, which is there all the time and which is reducing us to these sort of paralyzed state. We are Aun lying on his bed with this baby bottle while his descendants, the life of our descendants are being sacrificed in order to, for us to uphold our state of synthetic consumer comfort. We are the worst imaginable ancestors. Relation um, is, is being ruptured and lost in so many ways in our time. Also in relation to the myths that people are telling each other, myths are supposed to create relation uh, in positive fertile ways, but contemporary myths are often infantile parallel realities that are completely detached uh, from reality in these unrelated narratives. So we are own, um, in, and by the way, this, this uh, uh, thing here, no, I'm getting back, come on. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get back to that. Um, and uh, we also are own in our complicity with the violence against other than humans in other parts of the world. Uh, against other humans in other parts of the world, you know, uh, that is driven by the oligarchic economic order that we are complicit uh, with. We are on in our acceptance of this gruesome and life annihilating behavior to the whole non human sort of ecology of beings around us. Uh, also, the beings that are uh, becoming our food, uh, both plants and animals and everything, we are extremely destructive and abusive to all life around us from our uh, contemporary society. Uh, we are out in our loss of connectedness to the people closest to us because our social instincts are being hacked by these synthetic systems that tend to enclose us in these algorithm generated mirror cabinets that enhance our stupidest and basest sides and erode, for instance, uh, political and social debates uh, that should hold our societies together. This is all, uh, I think, the advancing Ragnarok, the advancing loss of relatedness in our world. And I think it's very visible that we have failed to perform these ancient rites of cyclical healing for about a millennia, you know. Um, but everybody didn't stop, you know, Hindus, for instance. They uh, have these uh, grand celebrations that they return to every, well, I can't remember if it's 12 years or something like that. And this kind of um, uh, grand celebration that return with, with, with a, a, a big number of, a larger number of years in between, they typically have this aspect of purifying the channels of relatedness uh, uh, in, in the world. These kinds of cyclically returning, typically pilgrimage celebrations, they are often something like that. Um, I have to say that I also find it remarkable that I think the only statement actually about the purpose of the Nordic, pre-Christian Nordic celebration, that seems to be exactly that. Um, Tidmar of Merseburg, who describes this ritual in Lyra in Sealand, he says that the, the ritual was supposed to align people with those who dwell beneath the earth and ensure their forgiveness for misdeeds. And of course, that sounds kind of Christian, and it could be something that he has made up, this whole forgiveness kind of thing. However, it also does sound quite a lot as uh, stuff that typically goes on in that kind of celebration, a realignment with spirits of the earth, for instance, kind of purification um, in the Christian uh, and Jewish celebration, the, the year of um, Jubilee or the uh, year of Yubal in the Jews, it is, there are stuff like remission of sin going on. 
sin is, is before it became a moral thing in Christianity, it was a, um, a kind of impurity or contamination that, uh, that this expressed a little bit like karma, something like that. Um, so, uh, and this uh, relational crisis is that loss of, yeah, connectedness. <laughs> Uh, and pre-Christian Scandinavians, they had really, really strong awareness about the potential proximity of that, that the world might actually be falling apart. That was something that they worried quite a lot about. And I think we need to recover that feeling well, because the world is falling apart uh, and we do know it. Um, there are uh, also contemporary myths and contemporary myths and, and um, cultural expressions that seem to either express this falling apart, express the relational crisis, or perhaps try to recover connectedness in, 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 in so many different ways. Um, and perhaps we can use, use some of these current myths of our time to understand Aum at a deeper level, to understand the Aum logic in our world at a deeper level, because they are contemporary explorations of this loss of connectedness uh, and power predicated on violence, right? One uh, example is the movie, The Matrix, where um, totally like Aun, humanity in this Matrix mythology is reduced to this par paralysis of com comfort that is predicated actually on cabal cabal cannibalism. This is humans who are grown by these machines and they're being fed human protein through tubes, a little bit like Aun there with his baby bottle. Uh, another example, uh, of a contemporary uh, uh, myth is the QAnon. Like Aun, the QAnon mythology is a myth about how power is predicated on violence towards children. And of course, the literal QAnon narrative is uh, comical in its manifest insanity. I mean, Hillary Clinton is not the kingpin of a global sex cannibal cult, you know, but uh, there's a layer of truth in there as well which is that the power that Hillary Clinton represents, that is, in a sense, cannibal eating our children, for instance, by insisting on accelerating the insane destruction of, of, uh, of our planet. You know, you see the healing potential in this way of using the own narrative uh, and the own ceremony uh, that, that, uh, that it, in fact, it might be able to heal some of the most infantile and idiotic destructive trends of our time by basically giving them what Tyson Juncker Porter calls a right story, a legitimate contemporary myth that actually speaks rightly and creates positive relate, uh, relational patterns uh, about the, the, uh, this underlying truth that is somewhere deep below these rather crazy ideas, right? Um, so instead of uh, uh, also, the, the, the deeply comical idea of, for instance, Donald Trump as a savior. Uh, <clears throat> I think that the own complex has a potential to perhaps teach people in that way how we are own. We are that worst imaginable ancestor uh, eating our own children. And we should, you know, consider how to stop doing that. You know, uh, I think, by the way, that this kind of healing potential is something, uh, it, it part of the, the reason that media and elites sometimes tend to reproduce imagery of North European traditional knowledge as in part dangerous and in part as infantile silliness. And I'm not, not saying that there isn't a deeply problematic interface between, uh, for instance, heathendom and fascism. There is an interface. However, when the global media chooses this clownish figure here as an exotifying image of, hold on to something, an evangelist revival movement. Global media chose that as the icon of an evangelist revival movement. Then it just seems to me that the global media just loves this interface between North European traditional religiosity and, and, and uh, deplorable stuff a little bit too much. <laughs> you know, uh, there were probably other images available. Um, and, uh, and, and but this is a bit of a sidetrack. But the sidetrack. But there are very strong tendencies in our time, I think, to reproduce um, uh, uh, to reproduce this cultural marginalization of North European traditional knowledge, um, which is sort of a it's an other side to the fact that there also actually is a connection. Anyway, uh, or the, uh, the, the, there are these 
my this mining of uh, of our traditional heritage going on. Cool. So how to bring this whole thing and these whole complex of thoughts and stuff? <laughs> how to bring that into concrete ceremony? And here, uh, here's where I'd like you know encourage you all to, to think with me a little bit. How do we invoke? How do we call on that? Well, I'm afraid to use the word red pill, you know, but but uh, um, that awake, awakening, that realization of the own logic that our social systems are predicated on, you know, um, how do we, uh, how do we, yeah, call on the the realization of the relational crisis in order to stop healing it, you know, how do we, you know, invoke those powers that would exactly make us good ancestors. Um, and when I spoke to uh, Johan Heg there from Amara Martha, his, uh, his wife Marie, Maria, uh, they had this uh, awesome idea, Maria, uh, she had this awesome idea that uh, of people sacrificing some of themselves by renouncing some of that life comfort that depends on those destructive patterns. Uh, perhaps some will say, and this is just an example, you know, I will become a vegan, you know, or perhaps just I will never eat meat on Thursdays, uh, uh, or I will only eat meat that I've participated in killing myself, or something like that. You know, they, they could, now this is just meat eating as an example, it could be a lot of other stuff too, you know. Um, uh, I eat meat myself, by the way. Um, I also spoke to, uh, I then spoke to Matthias Nordic actually about this idea. Um, and we got the idea of, and this is just like us kind of, you know, uh, spitballing together. Uh, we got the idea of, of, of perhaps making oath taking rituals in that connect, uh, in, on that, uh, and, and, and uh, using, for instance, the Aun rune. Uh, you can take oaths to do this or that under the own uh, room, perhaps. Um, and I have a video that explains exactly why this bind room represents the the, the own year. Um, another suggestion has been uh, festivals and gatherings that take up the own theme. So the American uh, rock festival, Fire in the Mountains. Uh, <clears throat> Matthias is telling me that they're sort of considering to have an own theme in, in 2023. And if they add, act on it, you know, and actually make it an out theme, then dang, you know, we should go to fire in the mountains. Um, I really hope that um, that uh, uh, other festivals will, will also take up the mantle here, uh, even though this does imply a little bit of a social criticism. Uh, um, another thing is like, I've said, generally, I've just suggested the idea of pilgrimages, like the Hindu Kumela here. Uh, perhaps on the actual dates in Lyra and Uppsala, on the 6th of January in Lyra and on the 6th of March in, in Uppsala. These are the dates um, of the uh, historical Aun celebrations uh, for next year. Um, I want to myself set up, uh, try to set up some sort of ritual with some music in Lyra on, uh, on January 6th, which will then uh, you know, work as, as an opening of, of the Aun year. Um, but the question is also, you know, what exactly needs to happen? <laughs> and uh, I really want to encourage people to use their imagination and, and just think with this uh, and sort of get active in, in making it happen because uh, I, just, I just I just threw out this idea, hey, let's have an hour year. But then I, afterwards I discovered, oh shit, what to actually do about it. That's actually something that that that, that we need to figure out. And you are as good as me is at figuring this out. It's not I don't have kind of the the, the final uh, um, idea about what what can happen. So um, so yeah, we need to. I think we need to. If we want this to happen, then we need to get involved in it and and and, uh, and 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 think with it and think with the stories. There's a lot of stories that talk about uh, relate relation and breaks on relation. In in one old uh, Norwegian tale, a woman recovers her lost relation uh, by traveling into the other world and remaking the relation to her fair spouse. Right. This is a story with a happy ending. Perhaps some stuff in there can be brought into ritual somehow. Um, in, a, in a Danish story, a woman heals her relation to this monstrous prince uh, by taking him through actually uh, 
as uh, sort of masochist bed, bed chamber torture, where she's gradually unveiling her naked body uh, and then forcing him to shed his serpent hides. And then he, she ends up whipping him into a bleeding lump of meat. And then she can marry if he, if he becomes available to be a uh, common human. And, and uh, <laughs> I think it's a really powerful ritual uh, sort of suggestion in there, actually. Uh, I got this image from a fairy tale book, by the way, that uh, I got from my grandparents when I was about eight, eight years old. Um, but funnily enough, I've tried to share it on Facebook uh, in groups uh, with the self-designated witches. I thought this initiatory female sexual power, just it had to be their thing. But I, but they actually found it controversial, which is also a little bit of a weird sign of our times that I don't really know how to make it make out of it, you know, that my sweet and church-going grandparents would give an eight-year-old something that is basically so witch-like uh, that uh, that people uh, who fancy themselves witches actually find it uh, offensively sexual. Uh, anyway, um, another example of this is um, uh, that there's actually a quite wonderful parallel to this uh, this particular story in in a, uh, in ritual uh, from uh, my friend the Swedish scholar Ole Mullervan who is uh, working on bear totem relating in Hedjedalen where he's from in, in northern Sweden and these people would actually ritually hunt and then ritually skim a bridegroom that has been masked as a bear in order to create a human for marriage out of him and that's kind of a ritual relation meeting of uh, of sort uh, so perhaps, you know, people can work with stuff like that and pull out, you know, useful stuff, you know. So, yeah, this is uh, just my thoughts. Um, I, and uh, I hope, hope it was, uh, made sense and was coherent. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I would like uh, to uh, just hear if you guys want to come with some input or what you, what you basically think about this whole crazy thing, how to... Uh, how to ritualize, how to bring a contemporary, meaningful calling on healing of our relational crisis through this own, uh, own celebration. Cool. That was, that was what I had. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, um, as I said, I, would, I think it would be really cool if we had a little bit of dialogue about it. Thank you, Rune. That was fascinating um so people do we have some questions for room uh, yes <laughs> uh hi you hear me hey <laughs> hey rune uh you see I've, I've gone through a little bit of a name change um yeah aka tanya uh first question i heard the date 6th of march so these are two dates that Historically, it has landed on. Did I hear it yes. right? Yes. Uh, do you want to, to explain why it's two dates? Yeah. These two dates. Uh, really good question. First, there are two uh, chroniclers who talk about this, uh, this octennial celebration in the Viking Age. Sidmar of Merseburg and Adam of Bremen. Sidmar of Merseburg talks about it in Leiva in Sealand and Adam of Bremen in Uppsala. The uh, celebration that Tidmar talks about in Leiva took place, actually took place on exactly the 6th of January because that was the, uh, the uh, what's it called in English? I think it's called King's Day, Three King's Day. And so, so we can actually see that it took place on that day, but it is actually a, a, a moon face that marks the date. And in 2023, it lands on the 6th of January. Uh, as it did in, in Tidmar's, uh, Tidmar's time. But the celebration in Sweden was uh, described by Adam of Bremen was somewhat later in the spring. It was around the time of the, uh, of the vernal equinox. So I basically built on uh, um, the amazing Swedish scholar Andreas Norberg's reading of these datings and so on. Uh, and uh, the the uh, moon face that marks the, uh, the celebration in Sweden is, is March 6. However, our idea about doing this has also been to expand it a little bit, to say we have a year of our, we, we need to open up a little bit also in order to inspire 
the uh, the uh, what what it actually it makes sense for people to do today. Uh, so we are actually thinking about it a little bit as a general theme that people can work with throughout the year of 2023. Uh, a little bit like you have Black History Month or something like that. We're thinking let's have a a, a year of healing, uh, and this has very much sort of like. For instance, the thoughts that I'm presenting to you now, they've made very much emerged through dialogues with people. Uh, in the beginning, we didn't even, you know, I, I didn't know what it was about. I just know that there were, that this dating made sense and people kind of could see that. So yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And it, um, it, it, it's very inspiring and it gives me a lot to work with here. And the 6th of January in Iceland is called the 13th here. <laughs> and it's yeah. where, where the wild, like we could say the wild hunt and all the spirits are going back, you know? So we already do ritual on that day. Mm. So having that on the year of on is quite intense and cool. And also I, I get some leeway to think about what do we want to work with the fall where we usually do big sacrifices, but this is um, in, in uh, regards to relation connection, a, a long oath, you know, like a commitment, eight years. I think this is very important for, uh, it can be very important for humans today um, to give back, to get that balance back. And my plan is to, because some of the sacrifices I have here, I, I it's pretty close, it's not public, especially during COVID years, but opening it up and giving the people an opportunity to step in mm. That is that is some that's where I'm working from right now, and um, thank you so much for this talk. It's very inspirational and clarifying these dates, and I will definitely utilize the year. <laughs> totally awesome, man! It's, it's really awesome to hear, and I think combining with stuff like the 13th day uh, Yule, uh, we also have this this date in, in Scandinavia. It's called I think it's called Three Kings in in, uh, in English. I think working with traditions on that is is a, is a really good idea. Because there's some actually some really uh, intense ritual, for instance, ritual masking and stuff like that going on uh, traditionally on that date, uh, and it just so happens in 2023 that the, the heathen Yule, the Yule Moon, falls on that date, and that's why it's uh, uh, it, it falls close to the to the winter solstice. So yeah, yeah. goosebumps. That gives me goosebumps. With, we have the masking and the bonfires anyway, so we'll just amp it up. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so cool. much. Ron. You're welcome. Uh, I have a hand up from Karina Backstrom. Karina? Um. Yes. Good. Uh, good afternoon, Runa, and thank you so much for speaking for us. Um, and I had so many thoughts when you were talking. Um, my understanding from what you were saying is that. We need to take this year and try to do some healing of the earth. I think that was your general idea, but I'm also, but I've also been thinking it just seems like it might also be a good year. Um, I'm, I'm seeing so many people jumping on next year as the on year and beginning to talk about it. And I think that in our communities, I think that's largely happening because of you. Um, I noticed this year that foreign said sparage I, I could be wrong on this, but it seems to me from what I understand that over maybe the last year or so they've adopted your way of dating calendars and stuff. Um, and it seems like a, a lot of organizations are starting to do that. Um, and it just seems to me that healing the earth in one year, if that's what we're talking about, I think we should all try to do that, but it's also a very, very big, uh, that's a pretty, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's grandiose, I'm not sure we can do it in a year, <laughs> but, 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 but healing heathenry though, I think that since everybody is beginning to get excited about on year, and I think that you've had a lot to do with that. Um, I think that is also a very, very valid and worthy goal for this year. And uh, another thing is that there's a few women in here that also, um, moderate other Facebook groups and that sort of thing and seem to have some influence. And I'm thinking that we all need to maybe try to work together a little bit and get get messages out a little bit more in a more um, not organized fashion exactly, but just kind of working together uh, and maybe establishing some goals uh, 
that we could all help each other out. Um, and there was, oh, there was one last thing. I'm just going to spit this out really quick. You, you know, I got a, I have a different idea about on year and on. Um, and I could be totally wrong, but my reading of the story is that the sacrifices were okay at first because the king did these, this, these terrible, terrible is not the right word, but he did these very deep sacrifices of something very, very important to him to keep his relationship with the land and to keep his kingship because things were going well. And then he got kind of greedy and got selfish at the end. And that's when he got really sick and was laying in bed crapping on himself. <laughs> and, so, and that's kind of my interpretation of on and the on stories that making a sacrifice for the greater good, uh, the gods might help us out. But when we're doing it just to be selfish, it's not going to work anymore. But I'm just throwing that out there. Thanks so much for speaking uh, for us. We, we all really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this. I, I totally think uh, like stuff like the last thing you said about these uh, the sacrifice. Uh, I think that well, I mainly read it as a cautionary tale. However, I think it's really important to have, that these kind of myths uh, keep their uh, their multiple meanings that you can read multiple meanings into them. Like I, I try to you know read the own myth from the perspective of the matrix mythology, right? You know, and, and that kind of creativity and, and uh, is, I think, really important in doing it. I also think your idea of uh, connecting between even groups and stuff like that, I think is a really good idea. Um, my personal inclination goes actually to look out of, uh, for instance, heathenry, but that's just my thing. I th For me, the perfect thing would be if, the Glastonbury Festival would make an arm theme in, in 2023, right? Because then it, it 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 moves out of sort of the those mirror cabinets and and enclosed spaces where, for instance, people are are trying working to recover Nordic uh, religion. But that's just my my uh, inclination. Um, and I think that this particular thing, I think it has. It has a bit of a potential to become sort of a general thing, something that you don't necessarily have to be super heathen in order to appreciate, you know, that uh, the, 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 the impulse, the impulse, right? And I also think that healing, <laughs> healing the world in 2023, it, it, I, we're probably not going to succeed, uh, but we can call on that healing. We can call on that healing, and we can, uh, and uh, and I think that is also super important, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, now I'm just going and in, going into the dialogue as if I was being asked something. Maybe people should link a little bit more so I don't speak too much. <laughs> Thank you, Rune. We have another hand up, Jess. Hi, Rune. Um, I was wondering, um, I totally am with you on this idea of like mirror cabinets and people having their own really, um, their, their own reality that's very separate from our, from our collective reality. And I'm wondering if you came across any myths or rituals or charms around helping to break this kind of, um, this really powerful spell of delusion, this idea that the earth can be sick and in peril and we can be fine if we just switch to electric cars. Like how do we break this wider spell of delusion that feeds um, the loneliness that so many people feel? Um, I know that's a big question, but I was just wondering if in your research you came across anything like that. Um, no. Uh, I think that when you encounter people who are, for instance, encased in really delusional shit, which you sometimes do. Uh, I have experienced that it is functional to, I, and it's a difficult question. It's, it's sometimes it's a little bit like when to cancel and when not to cancel, right? But sometimes it can actually work to make social space available for these people and enter, enter into dialogue with them. Sometimes probably totally not. In, like in generally you can't, safe people <laughs> but but if but some but some people actually want to move and some people even perhaps want to be saved 
Hallelujah. <laughs> but, um, um, but also, I think with regards to the wider patterns of healing, well, as you can hear, I'm a pretty idiosyncratic person myself. Like, yeah, consumerism is evil. But, um, but I, I think actually in some ways it's a part of it is probably also to step out of our, uh, our preconceived ideas of, of how, how, what the healing is necessarily going to look like. Uh, like, uh, I know this might be controversial. And I also, I don't have a, a, a strong opinion about it myself, but I know very, very knowledgeable um, eco-activists uh, debaters who strongly believe that we should all go nuclear power as soon as possible uh, uh, because uh, well reasons uh, and uh, and uh, I'm not I'm, I'm, it, 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 I was a bit surprised when I heard that but that idea the first time and I know there's a lot of people who strongly do not believe that um, but I, I think that's at, at least some level of sort of uh, uh, being prepared to listen to stuff like that, stuff that might, you know, really rob, you know, my own idiosyncrasies the wrong way uh, is probably important. And this also has to do with stuff like, I think, nostalgia and ideas of the past as necessarily ideal. I think stuff like, for instance, Nordic animism, really important that it doesn't become the sort of nostalgic thing where we kind of worshipping an age where people were, had, you know, folk costume students and play violence all the time this kind of thing but that it's it, it it sort of becomes something that actually fits our uh spaces which in, in many of our cases are urban spaces um i also know very knowledgeable people about uh, when it comes to stuff like sustainability who says well all human beings should just m move into cities as soon as possible that will give some space for uh for biodiversity. If we all move to the countryside and start growing cabbage, as most of us dream about doing, myself included, then, 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 then there won't be a butterfly left on the planet because everywhere there will be an ecologic cabbage farmer. Um, so, and, and this is, again, is something it's kind of goes against the ideas that we would tend to expect or would like to see. You know? and, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Or... No, absolutely. Thank you so much for your insights. And we have a question on the chat room uh, from Kirsten Lovett, who's saying, what the Arn story made me think of was our capitalist society of extraction and using both the earth and people for fuel can no longer be sustained. Do you feel this is in line with the Arn message from an animist perspective? Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I think extra like extraction that our uh, consumerist society is extraction-based. That is part of the core root of it, um, that, 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 that we are in a, at our root, we are so disruptive. You know, when all these kind of, of uh, for instance, the technology that we have, which is, it represents an insane level of human capacity and technology, but we buy a new smartphone and throw it out two years later. It's it. We we have this insane, insane consumption patterns, and this is of course rooted in capitalism. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for Room? Um, yeah, I I don't know how to wave my hand on this program, but <laughs> so hi. Um, what? One thing I know from experience of creating space for ritual or, you know, for ceremony that when you prepare it and when it happens, there is, we have also created a space for spirit, whether it's our own or the higher spirits. And there's so much mechanism that works in within that. And most people that have, I've joined in ceremony with, they find it quite grounding that it clears things up, gives them clarity, perspective, and, you know, like when people are kind of like offshoot, you know, like we're unreal or anything like that, then when we create this opportunity, things get grounded again. And we also are meeting and doing this as community. And there's this like this, there's this something that just happens within the people that show up around the fire or around the ritual. 
that it can be quite grounding and and part of well what we really want to do is maybe save our reputation on earth as human beings and creatures i think the earth will do fine without us but when we do gather and make this kind of sacrifice and reconnection um it will affect like what kind of choices we make automatically i think so we just kind of like let the ceremony do the work too and absorb what mm. kind of comes through through spirit and through the spirit of the community i just yeah. wanted to share that thank you yeah totally totally and and i also think that that uh, that also i think it also has to do a little bit with with the idea of trying to reach into the wider public, like the, this vision of uh, man, if, if the burning man in 2023 or the, the Glastonbury, you know, if they would make an own theme of the Roskilde Festival, even uh, probably too, probably too conservative for that, you know, but, but, uh, but, but then that would, it, it would be a huge sort of, uh, it, it, it would be propelling that way of thinking and it would actually bring it into ceremony not only in the very concrete um sort of ritual way that i a uh, uh, sense that you're talking uh, about here uh is it's Isval, right when we met in iceland it was tanya okay yeah. uh, we, we, um the um uh, but also that that i mean it would really sort of write into our culture at a very foundational level that this logic is there to be addressed and i think that would be in itself really uh really healing actually yes. and being just being a witness w witnesses of ceremony are so it can be very important if it's that way you know and just that witness you never know what really that does to the mentality of people just being able to see this happen like what we witness can move emotions move our uh, uh, awareness just as we are witness of other ceremonies from other traditions around the world, it moves us. So I, I, I like really like that's why I want to open it up to make it public, put it in the newspapers, do a, it's like a like a work of art, you know. Yeah. I like yeah. this idea of sculpture, you know. Yeah. So it is something fascinating. So what yeah. does it mean? Mm -hmm. Then that that will take on a life of its own, maybe for the next eight years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I also think art is, is really, like when art kind of work with both with popularism, actually reading, reaching broad populations, but also with, with uh, activism at the same time can be so powerful. Uh, no, I don't want to start talking about giving you examples about this because there are other people who want to say something. Mm -hmm. but, and we have two people waiting with questions. So if we go to Linda Haggerston next. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm trying to put my hand down here before I start. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I do a lot of interfaith work and I am an animist. Um, I'm a druid. And my question is around how to bring people together. Um, I do know examples of this and it's it's sort of pre <laughs> if you like, what's happening. But I want to do something more locally. My, my accent gives uh, you the wrong impression. I'm actually in Scotland. And I'm very interested in trying to bring people together. It's not easy. Um, I find things to be very insular, or I should say groups to be very insular or familial, or there's a lot of individualism. Um, it can be difficult, not impossible, but difficult. Um, so how do you bring people together is kind of, you know, what I need to, one thing I need to know. The other one is that down in um, Cornwall, a friend of mine uh, is, is bringing over a group of elders from uh, Canada, First Nations elders, uh, including two spirit people, and they are, they are conducting for July and August, conducting no, nope, sorry about that, July through September, they're conducting rituals in different locations. Um, other people involved are Cornish and Scottish and English, and I don't know what else, from different backgrounds coming together for these rituals to, um, to heal relationships with each other across oceans and continents and with 
uh, the, the other beings around us, um, be they flora or fauna, fauna or other beings, and, and to heal, heal the earth and to heal our souls as well. So that's a big ask. That's something amazing that is happening. And I'm not going to look at things on that scale. But again, how do you, for people who sort of lost the connection, how do you, how do you bring that back when there's so much to divide us? Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, let, let me just uh, have, have one clarification. Uh, when you're talking about re bringing people together in Scotland, uh, and you mentioned that you are uh, into Druidry, are you talking about, for instance, people like uh, Celtic-oriented and uh, Germanic-oriented uh, pagans, heathens? Is that the kind of people you're talking about bringing together? It doesn't necessarily have to be from one particular group, although I think that's a good start to, you know, to bring groups of pagans together, groups of druids mm -hmm. together, but it could be interfaith groupings as well. Cool, cool, cool. Um, well, I, I, don't, I don't have a final answer to that question, but it's really important. It's really bloody important. And I think uh, when we talk about uh, different groups of, uh, say, traditional religiosities, for instance, in Northern Europe, I think it's important to start thinking it actually kind of trans-ethnically, because uh, at least if you think with animism, because animism is about relating to space uh, and the, the, the features of those spaces. And, that, and you, you can see this, for instance, in Scandinavia, when in Ole Müllerans uh, area there in Herjedal in Sweden, bear is an important relation. So, Swedish speaking, Harriet Darling, or whatever they call it, they have this relation. If you are a uh, Skogs Finn uh, or Sami, you have the same relation. It's because they're relating to bear. And then there might be kind of cultural differences in between what, what exactly they do about it, but there's certainly also cultural similarities. And we have a little bit that tradition of thinking our, uh, our traditional knowledge from this culturalist perspective. It is kind of there is a culture and that is sort of the unit that defines it. But I think we need to move into more of a, a, um, uh, a mode of thinking it from a real, more relational perspective. It's about it, there is perhaps a cultural aspect. We're bringing some culture with us. So if we're living in Arizona today as a diaspora Eurocentric, we have some, bag, some baggage with us. But the important part is also to look at the relation to, to specific landscapes. So I, I would say, like, if you have a place like Scotland that has both Celtic and uh, Germanic and Nordic also kind of traditions that, that have sort of gone into that kettle in order to produce uh, that, that uh, the people there, uh, I would say this is a way of relating to landscape. And it's documented from kind of a kind of a specific corner in, 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 uh, in northern Europe but if it is a way of relating to land and uh, it, it's a way of relating to the shifting cycles of light and how they align and realign so I think it should in that sense it ought to make sense in all of the northern hemisphere and let me just say about the uh, the uh, initiative that you were talking about of bringing over indigenous elders uh, to was it England uh, to do some he healing ceremonies there. Cornwall, <clears throat> yeah. Cornwall, Cornwall, yeah. Sorry to Cornish people there. Um, the, uh, uh, I think that's awesome. Uh, and I think that stuff like that, if stuff like that could be merged in with our own uh, ritual or our narrative, I think it would be perfect. There's a Native American um, uh, activist, eco-activist called Winona LaDuke, who wrote a, a book uh, with the wonderful title uh, or the wonderful subtitles, the Windigo Slayers. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing the Anishinaabeg right here, but Windigo is some sort of sort of vampire being. So she's she's talking about e eco uh, act, uh, being an eco -activ activist as being a Windigo Slayer, vampire Slayer, you know. <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, she's talking about this age of the Windigo people who are sucking the life out of. Uh, um, uh, the, the world, basically, uh, and 
that aligns so incredibly well with the myth and, and uh, narrative of the of the own logic. And I think that 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 working these things together, working lines between these things would be a really, really productive thing. Also because it sort of points towards wider public. You know, it would be something that would that would be interesting for for the wider public. And it would break, it would act, it would move this idea of relating people, for instance, across uh, oceans, it would bring it into the actual cultural level where it's not just us being like pastel colored white people who are sitting and sort of idealizing of going, wow, about how cool it is to be a Native American, but it would actually create, uh, create a relation. You know, it would actually bring that relation into being. I would actually, if, if you want to give me contact to these people, I would like to, to perhaps write them or something like that and just uh, pitch it. But also if you have contact with them, you're welcome to do yourself. I just want to shoot that out there. Thanks. <laughs> um, Karina has got her hand up. Karina, I know that we've very got quick. like a minute. Yeah, super, super quick. I just would like to have like some kind of central place, maybe, maybe here at HWU where we could check in from time to time about this. Um, maybe work a little bit like I'd like to know what I, I'd like to do some stuff in my local area with newspapers and, and I have you know friends that do music and stuff like that but I'm just kind of wondering if there'd be a place that I could kind of check in to figure out what the message is that I would be trying to get across and also maybe like a little cheerleading if we're so that we don't feel like we're just kind of individuals out in the out in the dark shouting out in the dark it would, would be kind of nice um but anyway that's that's the that was my only point thanks thanks everybody yeah, I, I actually at some point made a, a Facebook group about it, but I, I forgot the fact that, that many heathens are very dysfunctional in uh, communicating with each other. So people started fighting immediately, uh, and, and I actually closed it down because I wasn't really sure if it would basically be destructive to have it open. <laughs> but, but I think that that's a really good idea to have uh, uh, context about this. And let me mention another thing, by the way. Now, I men mentioned Blaida and Uppsala here. That's just two places that I met. The foundational idea is that people congregate at regional centers. So if you are in, in, in uh, North America or, or in, in, in Britain, there will be regional centers at, of importance over there where, where it will make sense to, to, uh, to congregate or even new regional centers can emerge. But uh, yeah, I, I think I should probably stop talking now. Somebody else is there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rune. Um, it's been fascinating. Um, Thanks. And obviously every big journey starts with a single step. So let's all hope that we can start making those individual steps, whatever they are, to making next year extra special, focusing on our relationships and healing things where we can. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more discussion in this in a lot of different areas. Thank you very much. My name is Rune Jane Rasmus. The work that I'm sharing with you on this channel focuses on recovering Euro traditional animist knowledge. This is the fruit of a life of study and research all over the world and I hold a doctorate from the oldest university in the Nordic region but I'm choosing to popularize rather than to focus on academic publication. Conventional institutions however have yet to warm up properly to my perspective so if you appreciate what i do then please do consider that i also need to feed my family uh, for the price of less than one beer per month you can become a patron supporter or you can head over to my web shop and enter into exchange relation with me you can also give single donations to my paypal account or if you have contact with someone that might help me project this incredibly important perspective to the world then do drop me a pm and uh, remember also to click the click and subscribe, follow, share, comment, and all that. Thank you very much.
Ya, ya.